And Book TV is on location at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, where we're talking with some professors who are also authors. Joining us now is Dr. Margaret Humphreys. Her book, Marrow of Tragedy, The Health Crisis of the American Civil War. Dr. Humphreys, you write that the Civil War was the greatest health disaster the U.S. has ever experienced. That's your opening line. True. How so? How so? Well, I mean, if you... You can count the numbers many ways, but one probably conservative estimate is that more than a million people died in those five years that would not have died, as they call premature or unexpected deaths, because of that war. And it is useful to think of war as a health crisis because you think about the women who died, the children who starved, the refugees who died of disease, uh, the people who died in prisoner of war camps, not just the ones who died from wounds or actually while in the army. What were some of the health problems faced by the soldiers specifically? We'll start there. Well, as a lot of people know, twice as many soldiers died of disease as died of wounds or something related to wounds. You take a bunch of farm boys who have not been exposed to much by way of disease, not even chicken pox and measles, cram them together into unsanitary camps, and they start getting sick. Not a surprise. The first rounds were all those infectious diseases, chicken pox, measles, mumps, smallpox. And then, as night follows day, the contents of their bowels mixed with the contents of their water supply and dysenteries and diarrheas started happening. Not your usual flags flying glory of the war, but 30% of the deaths from disease were from diarrheal illness in the war. So those military camps were, in a sense, instant slums with no sewers, with very poor sanitation, and men started dying from them before they even went into battle and said hurrah. So that's my approach is fairly earthy, you might say, to what happened in this war. What about some people at home? Like you said, women starving, children starving? Well, one of the things that happens, and again, people don't think about this all that much. If, if you think about the fact that the Union Army almost immediately starts taking bites out of the South. They, they take Northern Virginia, they take Southern Coastal, sorry, South Carolina, the Coastal South Carolina. In the spring of 1862, they're into New Orleans, to Mobile. They've taken West Tennessee, and people are terrified. The Southern families are terrified, and they start to move. They try to run away from the Union Army, or they run to St. Louis, which is Union, but at least it's not in the middle of battle. And they're on talking about white people. Black people saw a chance to escape from slavery, and they start to move and run into Union lines wherever they can get there, in Virginia, in Kentucky in New Orleans and set up refugee camps. Nobody's setting them up for them. This isn't like nice Red Cross camps with tents. They just are camping in the woods wherever, trying to survive. So civilians are affected. Armies, when they go through a landscape, they take all the food in that landscape. They burn the fences that are keeping the deer away from the corn. They take any food that's available in barns and so forth. So. The civilians end up in a war landscape, frightened, scared. When Sherman goes through Georgia, of course, he burns things deliberately. So the civilians are short of food, they're hungry, um, they're infected with diseases they wouldn't otherwise have had. All those sorts of things add to the mortality of the war. What about the prison populations of the soldiers? I'm sorry? The soldiers in, in right. uh, enemy prisons. So both sides had prisoner of war camps. Of course, the most famous is Andersonville in Georgia. Uh, but the Union had prisoner of war camps too in Elvira, in Camp Douglas in Chicago. There's a, a book that makes its um, attitude pretty clear from its title, which is To Die in Chicago. Um, <laughs> they, and both sides, historians, who favor both sides are still fighting about whose prison camps were worse. There's no reason anybody should have died in prisoner war camps. If they were well fed, if the camps were clean, uh, 
uh, if the men did not get infectious diseases, and particularly as the war goes on, most of them had already had a chance to acquire most of the common infections. But the South, either, depending on who you ask, deliberately starved the people in the prisoner of war camps, or I didn't have enough food to feed their own people, so what can you do? And the North was knew about this. They started getting prisoners on exchange who were just skeletons, so they started cutting back on the rations. And particularly in 1864, the treatment of prisoners of war became one of the flashpoints of the conflict that we we were being nice before. We were perhaps being Christian, they would have said before, but now you're being so evil, we're going to be evil. And the treatment of the prisoners of war got worse and worse during that year. Um, and the Confederates moved a lot of prisoners out of the Richmond area, took them to South, Al South Georgia to get them out <coughs> of the line of the armies and didn't even pretend to set up any kind of lodging for the people that were in Andersonville. They just put a stockade around them and said, if you want shelter, dig a hole in the ground. And, you know, that, it was probably just about the worst situation you could imagine uh, for those men to be in. And they started dying in large numbers. They had so much scurvy, and scurvy is caused by lack of vitamin C. You need vitamin C to heal, that any little cut would cause gangrene in their their arms to be amputated because they didn't have any they couldn't heal and that sort of thing amplified uh, the deaths in the prisoner of war camps in a very tragic way dr humphreys did we learn did we make medical advances during the civil war as well there's a few things they it, it's hard to point to something specific it's not like for example in world war ii Doctors learned to use penicillin. They learned about DDT to control mal the malaria mosquito. In the Civil War, more of what you get is the dissemination of ideas that a few doctors knew, but now every doctor left the war knowing. For example, chloroform and ether anesthesia were new technologies in the early 1850s. A lot of doctors were suspicious of them. They thought chloroform was dangerous. The British in the Crimea, for example, which comes in the mid-1850s, wrote that it's dangerous to use chloroform, or we had these deaths from chloroform. Well, by the end of the Civil War, I think it's fair to say that every surgeon, Union or Confederate, knew how to use chloroform, knew how to use ether anesthesia, knew how to do amputations. When you, when you do 25 in a day, you, you learn. Um, so that's one issue. A second issue is they learned a lot about contagious diseases and how to how to control them with fresh air and cleanliness. This is before the concept of the germ theory, but they had concepts about what caused wound infections that if they acted on them, worked. Um, so if gangrene broke out in a hospital ward, they isolated those men. They actually said, well, put them under canvas, meaning they built hospital tents out in the yard so that the men with gangrenous infections are kept away from the others and don't infect the others. Um, they emphasize ventilation, rest, cleanliness, things that let men survive um, much better. They were very proud of the fact that the death rate in hospitals in the Civil War, particularly the Union side, was so much lower than the British hospitals in the Crimea just six or seven years before. So these sorts of things, which may seem not very high tech to us, did make a difference in, in survival. There were a few things. There's a, there's a medicine called bromine, which is similar in the periodic table to chlorine. And they learned a way to use that to cleanse wounds in gangrene. The patient had to be under anesthesia because it's so painful. Um, and they got very good results in stopping gangrene that otherwise probably would have been fatal. But mainly they learned from each other that, that we, we're used to now in American medicine, you have big fancy hospital and there's the senior gray haired docs at the top and then the lesser and then the fellows and then the residents and the interns and the medical students. American medicine hadn't seen that, but they saw it in the Civil War. Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond had 5,000 patients and it got organized so that there were teams and the, 
the more experience taught the less experience. So 